Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service of the Leoma Church of Christ. If you're a member at the Leoma Church, of Leoma Church of Christ, we hope it will be soon that things will be where you'll feel comfortable coming back and worshiping with us in person. If you are not a member of the Leoma Church of Christ, we certainly would invite you to come and visit and worship with us anytime that you can. Throughout this coming week, I would like for us to keep in mind what Paul told the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 9, when he said, Let us not come weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let us now go to God in prayer as we begin our worship service. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of this life. Father, we thank you for being the loving God that you are and the love that you have for us. Father, we are thankful for this means that others can worship you. And Father, we just pray that the worship will be uplifting to all who watch. And Father, we just pray that this virus will soon end and things can be back to normal. But Father, we ask your continued blessings upon us. Watch over us and protect us. Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins. We pray that you will draw us close to you, that our faith will increase. And we just pray that we continue, can continue to enjoy the re religious freedoms that we now enjoy. This we ask in your son's name. Amen. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. this King through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died in eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways, from pole to pole that wars may cease, absorbed in prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend, their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, and the blessed Spirit through from yonder glorious throne. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. 
God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon. To prove my Savior lives Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives All fear is gone Because I know the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still, the calm assurance, this child can face uncertain days, because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day I'll cross the river fight life's fight all war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth a living just because he lives. This morning as we take of the Lord's Supper, I would like to read from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we are also rejoicing God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let us pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We know the plan of salvation was given through love, your love for humanity and Jesus' love for us, that he would suffer that death on the cross. At this time, we thank you for this bread that Jesus gave to his disciples, that he gave it that night before the, his uh, death, that they might remember what it was about, and that through that they might have courage in their future and remember him. 
As we take this bread, let us think of his suffering and his love for us. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Again, let's give thanks. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love as always, for everything, but especially through that blood of the sacred one, Jesus Christ, that through him without sin, he gave his life for us to purge us from our sins, not only for all that lived in his day and age, but all that lived till he comes again. Help us to retain of our thoughts of him and of his love for us. For so in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Earth holds no treasures but perish with using, however precious they be. Yet there's a country to which I am going, heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. To me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven holds all to me. Out on the hills of that wonderful country, happy, contented, and free. Loved ones are waiting and watching my coming. Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven holds all to me. Why should I long for the world with its sorrows when in that home o'er the sea millions are singing the wonderful story heaven holds all to me heaven holds all to me to me brighter its glory will be joy without measure will be my treasure heaven holds all to me now as we think about all that god's given to us we think about this time to continue the work of the church as normal we give on sundays if you're not able to be here we'd ask that you to stop by the church office and give your check or your contribution or mail into box 80 at the church they may receive that now let us pray dear god and heavenly father we thank you for all that you've given us we know that we're to be stewards of all we possess would ask your blessing upon the church here at leoma and our elders and the deacons that work under them as they do service for our community and for our church may we spread the word of jesus christ that other souls may be saved and the work of the church may gain love and blessings to you for it's in jesus name we do pray amen
This morning's Bible reading is taken from Luke chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. Luke 20, verses 1 through 8. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Good morning to you. Joshua here. Uh, I hope that you're staying safe and I hope you're, you're staying well. Was I, when I was in the fifth grade, actually the summer between my fifth grade and sixth grade, I was forced to change schools. Uh, I lived in the county, and my whole life, my parents had drove me to the city schools because uh, where I'm from at that time, the city schools were just better academically, had better teachers. So my parents made the decision to, to drive me every morning to town to school. And then the summer between my fifth grade and sixth grade year, the school board came up with a, a new rule that if you lived in the city, you had to go to the city schools. And if you lived in the county, you had to go to the county schools. And, and growing up, I was not a very outgoing person. Uh, I wasn't very loud. And I remember by the time I got to fifth grade, I'd made a lot of friends. And now these people that I didn't even know, these people that had never met me, were telling me to do something that I didn't want to do. or that my parents didn't want to do. My parents gladly took me to the city school every day. But in reality, it didn't matter what I wanted. It didn't matter uh, what I wanted to do. What mattered was those people were in authority. Those people uh, had authority over me and what I did and where I went to school. So I had to submit to them. And I think authority and submission is something that, that isn't too far from our minds. Uh, from the very beginning, we've had someone with authority over us, whether it be our parents or our teachers or just adults in general. We've always had someone in authority over us. So uh, it's something that we're all accustomed to or used to or it's easy for us to understand. Keep that thought with me and go to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 18. Now before I get into this, I have to say that today's thought, today's lesson is not my own. Uh, it is not my original thought. A few weeks ago, I watched a lesson from Matt Cook, one of the professors at Freed Hardman University. And his thoughts and his points and the way he looked at scripture uh, is the driving force behind this lesson. Uh, so my goal today is to take that information, to take his thoughts, and to, to give it to you. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 20. Now before we get to Luke chapter 20, we have to know where we're at and what we're doing. So go with me to Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 45. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 45. And he entered the temple... And began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do. For all the people were hanging on his words. So we're at the temple. More importantly, uh, we're in the court of the Gentiles. So, in Jerusalem, in the temple, you had rings, or, or, or courtyards almost. So you had the outer, the outer ring, and then it comes a little smaller, 
and a little smaller and a little smaller and until you get to the most holy of holy places. But the big ring, the big courtyard, uh, was the court of the Gentiles. And anybody can be in this courtyard. It didn't matter where you're from or who you were, you were allowed in this place. And the more you went in, uh, Gentiles weren't allowed to go in farther than that. But they were allowed in this space. Uh, this area, uh, there were lots of commerce there. Uh, we read here Jesus driving out those people who did commerce. Uh, there were lots of teaching uh, that would happen. So a rabbi or a teacher would get a group of people and go to a corner or a certain area and would teach them. Uh, it was definitely the, the bustling place of the temple. Uh, let's see here. It was between 33 and 35 acres. So it was a pretty big spot. And anywhere from 70 to 75,000 people could fit in this. So we're not talking about a small area or a small group of people. We're talking about a huge courtyard. And that's where we are in Luke chapter 20, starting, starting in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes of the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things. Or who is it? They gave you this authority. So, the religious leaders of the time who didn't like Jesus, they come up and they make this question for him. And they think they've set a trap. They ask him, uh, by what authority do you do these things? Or who has given you the authority? And if Jesus answers, well, God has given me authority, then they will say that he is blaspheming and will be put to death and bad things. If he says... Anything other than God giving him authority, then it discredits Jesus. It basically says, I'm not as powerful or I'm not the son of God. So they think they have him in this trap. Going back to verse 3, he answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? So instead of answering yes or no or this or that, Jesus answers with a question. And he asks, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Verse 5, and they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, well, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death. So they are convinced that John was, that John, because they are convinced that John was a prophet. Um, so they're thinking of their answer. If they say that John's baptism was from heaven, then that gives credit to Jesus because John said, Jesus is more powerful than me. He is more important to me. But if they say that it was not from heaven, they're afraid that the people will stone them. Verse 7, So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And I love how Jesus answers here in verse 8. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. He says, All right, if you're not going to answer your question, I'm not going to answer yours. So we have this interaction between the religious leaders and Jesus. And then he starts up in verse 9 by telling a story, by telling a parable. Verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give, his, give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent... Yet a third, this one also, they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard. And killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? 
So this was a very common practice in those times. Uh, we call it sharecropping. Basically, someone owns a plot of land, and he has these group of people come in and, and farm it and work it, and as payment, they send part of their crops back to the man who owned the land. So the time came, and he sends one, two, three servants or tenants to go pick up to pick up uh, rent or to pick up the price for, for using this land, and they beat him up, and they send him back. And then the owner says, you know what? I'll send my son. Surely they'll respect my son, but they don't. They throw him out of the vineyard, and they kill him. And Jesus, answered, or Jesus ends it with this question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. Here, Jesus is talking about himself as the son and those that think they have the inheritance are the Jewish people. But Jesus says, those are not going to be the people that get the inheritance, but the Gentiles, everyone else. And, and here the religious leaders knew what he was talking about. Because they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The, stoners, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. In this passage, in this first part of Luke chapter 20, Jesus establishes that he is the authority. He is the authority for everyone, and he has been given authority from God himself. And I don't think that's new to us. That's not something that we've never heard. That's not revolutionary, that Jesus is the authority for us. So my first question for us is, have you placed your entire life under the authority of Jesus? And I think with that question, most of us would answer, of course, I've given, given myself to the authority of Jesus. But it's so easy just to give most of ourselves and to keep a little something to ourselves, to say, nope, this is going to be mine. It's not going to be given to Jesus. He's not going to have authority over this part of my life. It's really easy to do that sometimes. It's easy to compartmentalize and just give some of the compartments to him and to keep some to ourselves. So, have you placed your entire life under the authority of Jesus? Like I said, that's something very easy to comprehend and very easy to understand. My second question is, have you placed your life under the authority of those that Jesus has placed into authority? Let me say that again. Have you placed your life under the authority of those that, that Jesus has placed in authority? Go with me to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Listen to this. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists their authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Here we read that, that any governing authorities... They weren't placed there by themselves. God placed them there. Go with me to 1 Peter. 
First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it to be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent to, by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Here we read that we are to be subject, not for our sake, but we are to be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. The last verse, or verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and he ends it with honor the emperor, or honor that person that is governing over you. And I've always wondered, I've always wondered why. Why is it so important uh, that we should be subject or give our life over to the authority of, of the government, of the governing bodies? And I have to remember who he's talking to who he's talking to here in the Bible. And these people are not like us. We have freedoms today that most people will never know. These people had been taken over by, by the Romans. Uh, everything that they did was controlled by the Roman government. And he tells them to be subject to those people. I want you to think of the example that the Jewish people or the early Christians would have set if they would have been the people to start a, a riot or to start a revolution or to uh, not be submissive to the governing authorities. What example would that have set? I think now in how we have, we have had mask mandates and there are still certain uh, companies that require mask mandates. I went to Walmart the other day and I went in with my mask, and there was a guy going in front of me, and he didn't have a mask. Now, I remember the lady asking him at the door, hey, sir, will you please put on a mask? If you don't have one, we'll, we'll give one to you. And I remember he turned around, and he punched the glass door, and he said, I'm not wearing a mask, and there's nothing you can do to make me wear a mask. And she said, I'm not going to fight you going in. I, I don't know who that man is, but I do know uh, the example that he said and the mark that he left on me, uh, the memory that I have of him. And I think Christians, you know, we have a hard enough time with our reputation anyways sometimes. People have good and bad thoughts about Christians. Why would we add to that by not submitting to the authorities? If Florence, Alabama has a mask mandate and I go and I go there and I'm in Florence, I'm under the authority, I put myself under the authority of Florence, Alabama. No matter what that is, if it's masks or social distancing or anything like that, same as if I go to Walmart, same as if I go to your house. If I go to your house, I submit myself to your authority. And it would be different if the, if the government was asking us to do strange things, uh, like if every time you went to Florence, Alabama, there was this huge statue of, of anybody, of the governor of Alabama, and you had to bow down to that governor and you had to worship him. That would be a different story, okay? But we're not having any, anything that requires us to sin or requires us to turn our backs on God. So... Are you placing your life under the authority of Jesus and of those Jesus has placed in authority? Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. In my Bible, it's just one page over. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1. 
So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So Peter starts this off and he says, I exhort the elders among you as a feller, fellow elder. So Peter says, I'm talking to the elders as I'm an elder. Going to verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not, shameful, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. There are two important words. Two important words in this verse. Shepherd. Shepherd is to be with the sheep, to know the needs of, of the sheep, to, to shepherd and to love and to be with and to counsel. And the second one is exercising oversight, which literally means making the decisions for the church, uh, no matter what that is. Any type of business type related decisions or uh, any type of decision making. These are what the elders are supposed to do. Verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. I know of congregations that good or wrong they have requirements before you come into worship. You have to have a mask on and you have to sit in a certain place and you are uh, filed out at a certain time. I'm thankful that, that the elders here have not demanded anything from us. They've asked things, but they have not demanded anything or, or if you didn't meet their demands, you know, didn't allow you to come to worship. They haven't been domineering over us. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So here it says that, that those people have a shepherd, the chief shepherd, which is Jesus. Verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We read that Peter specifically talks about those that are younger. You who are younger, be subject to the elders. And I think that's because, generally speaking, the older someone gets, usually the less rebellious they are. Young people tend to be way more rebellious than, than an older person. So, what I'm about to say might make a few people mad, and, and, and that's okay. Uh, if you're mad at me, just shoot me a call and we'll talk about it. Uh, but at the beginning of the coronavirus, the elders did not demand anything, but they did ask. They asked that, that we would wear masks for the purpose of protecting ourselves and protecting other people. Um, some other things that they've done uh, if you haven't been to worship with us, we have tape on every other row. Uh, and that tape is to mark off pews, that way we don't sit close to one another. And the elders have, have asked us to respect that, to respect that tape, and, to, uh, and have asked us to wear a mask. And you might not agree with that. Uh, I'll tell you, there have been so many things uh, in my short time here that that the elder, elders and I have not necessarily seen eye to eye on, and that's, and that's okay. Uh, we have, uh, I've had ideas, and they've been shot down, and they brought up ideas, and I've not been too excited about them, and I've, I've let them know. Uh, uh, even this, this past week, uh, a week ago, uh, Morgan and I sat down with them and, and talked to them and told, told them of our struggles and how we're frustrated with the situation, and, and they heard us, and we heard them. So understand, understand that some people might not agree with everything that the elders do. But at the end of the day, there's still the elders here. And at the end of the day, the authority that's been given to them has been given to them by Jesus Christ. 
not, not of their own, but from Jesus. Have you placed your life under the authority of Jesus and of the people that, that Jesus has placed in authority? Go back with me to verse 5. 1 Peter 5, 5. The very last part of that verse says, For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I want to end today with a few questions, and then the lesson will be yours. First question is, If you cannot place yourself under the authority of those that Jesus has put into authority, if you can't do it, if you won't do it, can you really put yourself under the authority of Jesus? If, if you can't be submissive and you can't put yourself under the authority of the little things, can you Put yourself under the authority of, of the biggest thing, which is, which is Jesus Christ. Think of, think of uh, maybe your children or, or, or something like that. If you ask them to do something and they don't do it, do they respect your authority? Do they take your authority seriously? If you're not taking the authority of the government or the elders seriously, are you taking the authority of Jesus seriously? My last question will be the one from the beginning. Have you placed your entire life under the authority of Jesus and those that Jesus has placed into authority? If you need anything, please, please give me a call. We love you and we miss you and we hope you have a great day. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith, Faith is the victory. Faith. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith, faith is the victory. Faith, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread. And echo with our shout. Faith. Faith is the victory. Faith. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night, in Jesus' conquering name. Faith, faith is the victory, faith, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. 
Let us pray together as we close this service. Lord, I thank you for blessing us this Lord's Day, for allowing us to be able to use this uh, means to reach those who aren't able to get out. Lord, I thank you for those that work in this mission uh, work, that things will go well, that we can continue to offer services. I pray, Lord, for those that hadn't been able to get out, that soon we'll all be able to go back and to worship the way we've been worshiping. I pray, Lord, now that you would forgive us of our sins. Be with us, Lord. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Be with us. Forgive us of our sins. Keep us always in, in, in your path, go in your way, that we would someday have heaven as our goal. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.